a warm welcome to this panel discussion uh, titled The Future of No Work, Critiques, Utopias and Politics. Um, I'm really happy that so many of you made it tonight. So the interest was quite high, so we even had to book a bigger room. Um, my name is Stephanie Gerold. I'm a PhD candidate here at the Institute for Ecological Economics at the WU Vienna and at the Hans Böckler Foundation in Germany. Um, and I want to say a few words on the background of this panel discussion. So actually I organized together with um, three colleagues from the Department of Socioeconomics um, a research uh, workshop um, on critical perspectives on work and sustainable work, um, where we wanted to bring together um, different perspectives from different disciplines um, on work. So we had a one-day research workshop yesterday, um, which was really inspiring, and we all also invited um, two guests from abroad. And um, some of the participants and speakers yesterday are also here with us on the panel tonight. Um, we had a bit of challenge um, to rearrange um, during the last days because two of our panelists actually cancelled. Um, and cannot, they cannot be here with us tonight. So Silvia Kuba from the uh, Austrian Chamber of Labour, um, she became sick. But fortunately, um, her colleague, uh, Fridolin Herkommer, is here and uh, came here very spontaneously. So thanks a lot. Um, and also, um, David Frain could not come to Vienna um, this week because his baby is in hospital. So he also had to cancel his, um, his trip to Vienna. Uh, but he was so kind and uh, record a statement for us tonight, which we're going to watch on video uh, in a few minutes. Um, and also, uh, we have Franz Astleitner here. Um, he is a sociologist and um, is familiar with the concept of post-work, um, which is great because it enables us to um, later in this discussion refer uh, to this idea. Um, so thanks, Franz, also for being here, quite spontaneously. Um, I will introduce uh, the panel um, in a minute, but before, um, I want to say something about the aim of, um, of this uh, panel discussion tonight. Um, so, as I already said, we wanted to introduce and discuss some criti critical perspectives on work and the future of work um, and go beyond the mainstream debate. So, uh, what we hear every day, almost every day in the media is um, the discussion about robots taking away our jobs and automation and digitization as a kind of a process that comes above us, us like a natural force and we cannot do anything about it. Um, also, we see that actually every party from left to right, uh, the main policy goal is to create jobs and to bring everyone into paid employment and uh, out of unemployment. Um, and another issue is that work is hardly discussed in the context of the ecological crisis, um, which is also, I think, um, a very important issue. Um, so, if work is discussed in this concept, in this context, it's only um, in the framing uh, of uh, green growth and green jobs and developing uh, green skills. So tonight we want to take a bit uh, more critical stance um, and go beyond this mainstream um, discourses on work. Um, so we want to talk tonight about um, how the process of automation and digitization uh, might be shaped um, in a socially just way. Um, we also want to talk about forms of work that go beyond paid work. Um, we also will have a, a historical perspective on that. And uh, we want to talk about alternative visions and utopias of work. Um, and um, discuss about societies where work might not play such an important role or a very different role in society. 
Um, and also, I already mentioned it, um, what does it mean, the future of work, um, given that we are facing a severe ecological crisis? Um, so, um, now finally, our panel. Um, so, we have Dr. Lawrence Davis here uh, from University College Cork in Ireland. Um, he's a political scientist um, with a focus on radical political thought and he has published on anarchist theories and utopian politics, also on um, work utopias. Um, then we have Professor Andrea Komloshi. Um, she's a professor at the Institute for Economic and Social History at the University of Vienna. Um, and there she coordinates the program uh, Global History and Global Studies program. Um, she has also recently published a book um, titled Work, The Last Thousand Years. Um, then uh, Franz Astleitner, um, he is a researcher at the Institute of Sociology at the University of Vienna and at FALBA, the Working Life Research Center. Um, his research uh, focuses on um, work and working time, um, industrial relations and inequality. And he's also a founding member of the Arbeitskreis for Musikgang, uh, which can be translated um, as working group for idleness, something like that. So maybe you can also talk about that later on. Um, and then we have... Uh, here tonight, uh, Fridolin uh, Herkommer from the Austrian Chamber of Labor, um, where he's head of the program Digitization, the Future of Work, um, and he's working as an econo um, economic policy advisor at the Chamber of Labor. So thanks a lot for being here with us tonight. And then I also want to introduce briefly David Frain, um, who is not here with us tonight in person, but uh, via video. Um, he's a sociologist based at Cardiff University in the UK, and he has published the book The Refusal of Work, Theory and Practice of Resistance to Work. And um, with this, he has provided a standard reference on uh, post-work theories. Um, so, in the first round, um, I would like to uh, know what our panelists think about um, the title of our panel discussion, The Future of No Work. And um, I also asked David Frain to relate to the title of tonight's event um, and to briefly introduce the notion of post-work as um, yeah, many of you, of you might not be familiar with that concept. So we will see his uh, video statement now. I've been asked to respond to the idea of a future with no jobs. And I'm going to briefly set out a post-work perspective on this problem. Now at the broadest level, I would define post-work as a critical sensibility which refuses to accept that our current system, uh, a system very much organized around the institution of employment, uh, a refusal to accept that this kind of system is inevitable and ideal. And there's a whole history of academic work characterized by this sensibility. But post-work ideas uh, seem to have been revived in the past few years and I think this is because we're seeing more and more conspicuous signs of what some people are calling the crisis of work. So for me, the easiest way to think about crisis is in terms of the social functions of work. So if you consider that as a society, we've delegated so many crucial social functions to the institution of employment. Uh, paid work is the arena where we produce most of our goods and services. But it also has all these secondary functions as well. Uh, it's society's main mechanism for the distribution of income. So the institution of work is responsible for making sure we all have enough to live on. 
As we know, having a job is also meant to fulfil psychosocial needs. So things like giving people a sense of identity. Uh, we're socialised to turn to employment as something that's supposed to give us a sense of meaning and solidarity and collective purpose. You know, think about the way that we're always asking our children, what do you want to be when you grow up? Or the way that we always greet strangers by asking them what they do for a living. Uh, work is seen as being integral to identity. And when we talk about a crisis of work, we're referring to a situation in which the institution of employment is faltering in its ability to cater to all of these uh, economic and social functions. So work is not ensuring that everyone has an income because we have mass unemployment and underemployment and precarious labour in all its forms, uh, including the rise of zero hours contracts and the gig economy. And we also know that significant numbers of people remain in poverty uh, even when they're in employment. Uh, and then there's also the big one that everyone's now talking about, which is the spectre of automation. Although scientists can't seem to agree on the precise extent of the changes, there is a consensus that automated technologies will replace vast quantities of human labour over the next couple of decades. Now, in addition to all of these more objective problems, it's also clear that work is failing in its ability to provide its more subjective benefits. There was a recent poll in the UK uh, by YouGov, which found that 88% of people would retire on the spot if they were given enough money to live on. And I don't think this is altogether surprising. Uh, the American sociologist Eric Olin Wright reminds us that there's actually nothing in the logic of capitalism that compels it to cater to this human need for meaningful work. In most cases, the labour process is actually governed by economic rationality. It's designed to increase productivity and private profit, things that are usually won through standardization and discipline and the de-skilling and control of workers, and all of these things that sociologists know make workers feel stressed and unfulfilled. So there seems to be this huge gap between the cultural emphasis on jobs as a source of meaning and how a lot of people really feel about their work. And all of these problems represent what we might call the crisis of work. The institution of work is faltering in its ability to serve all of these really important economic and social and psychological functions. Now what's troubling is that despite this crisis of work, with all of its different dimensions and consequences, there still seems to be a real sense of political inertia when it comes to thinking of a solution. The solution still seems to be very much jobs, jobs, jobs. And I think this is true on the political right and on the political left. Uh, if we think about the US, for example, you know, we've seen two very different political figures, uh, Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump, who, despite their massive differences, both still ran for office with the promise of job creation, and this deep core belief in the importance of employment for human dignity. Uh, both candidates saw employment as integral to individual prosperity and who we are as humans. And so we see these recurring political orthodoxies on the right and on the left. Uh, we see the stress on the importance of jobs for having a healthy and civilised existence. We see interventions to help students and deprived sections of the population to become more employable. And we see the promise of job creation. Uh, we create new jobs by increasing economic output or expanding the economic sphere into new industries and sectors. And because we live in a system where people depend on employment for survival, this idea of development is relatively uncontested. There's not much critical comment on whether the jobs being created actually contribute anything of value to society. And I think that what's also overlooked is the unsustainability of this vision of development. On a planet with finite resources, we can't continue to expand the economy 
simply in order to compensate for this elimination of work by technology. And no matter how much this crisis of work escalates, you know, there still seems to be a real inertia in mainstream politics. We still see this very work-centered political orthodoxy. And I think this brings us to what post-work thinking is all about. You know, what it really aspires to do is to intervene in this sense of political inertia by creating a new orthodoxy. It wants to unsettle the way that we think about work. And the way it does this is by opening up the institution of work itself for some critical scrutiny. So we don't just talk about problems with wages and working conditions and all of those things internal to the world of work that trade unions care about. But we ask bigger questions relating to the value of work, the purpose of work, the amount that we work and whether that's actually necessary. Can we imagine more liberating social forms where people's security and status no longer depended on being in employment? So number one, instead of more work, what about less work? You know, one of the good things about capitalist development is that it's given us the technologies to produce the things that we need at a speed that we would have never before imagined. And instead of using this capacity to endlessly expand the economy and generate more commodities, might we actually be able to use it to give people more free time? Could national policies for a shorter working week actually create jobs not by expanding the economic sphere, but by distributing the necessary work more equally among the population? Number two, could we... In a, could we imagine an alternative system of welfare provision that would be more suited to a society where work is in crisis? Can we imagine a welfare system that would resource people to do something productive and valued outside the sphere of employment? A system that wouldn't condemn people to a life of shame and emptiness because their labour power isn't required by the formal economy? And number three is this important ethical question. You know, what's so great about work? One of the things that post-work writers feel passionately about is that there's so much that goes on outside the sphere of work that is still undervalued and unremunerated. Uh, we think about care work, domestic work, artistic work, uh, the work of self-care or political activism. By the same token, so much of what takes place within the sphere of employment seems to have little or no social value. Uh, to quote the anthropologist David Graeber, a lot of what happens inside the sphere of work is, to put it frankly, bullshit. And in response to all of this, post-work is really a call to rethink our attachment to the conventional work ethic. So I've been trying to define what post-work means, or particularly what it means to me. And I would really summarize it as an explorative thing and a utopian thing that wants to explore the possibility of a new politics, a new ethics, and new kinds of social relations that might be more suited to a society where work is very clearly in a state of crisis. And to finish, I'll just say that I think to really grasp the nature of the challenge presented by this crisis of work, we have to see that it's not just a practical or an e economic question that we need to answer. We actually need to think about how we want to live. Post-work ultimately is a defense of the right to human autonomy. So after the education system is done training us to assume a predefined job role, after the necessity of making a living has forced us to specialise in one tiny thing at the expense of all of our other talents and capacities, after the standard 35-hour working week has partitioned our free time into little chunks, and after a day of alienating work has drained off all of our energy, then what's left of us? After all this, one of the questions that post-work writers implore us to ask ourselves 
is how much of our time can we truly say is free from economic imperatives? Is this how we would choose to live if we were given the option? Thanks um, <laughs> to David's uh, talk. Um, so, um, I would like to start with you, Franz, um, um, and ask you um, whether you share the, these perspectives of David Frain and which aspects um, you would emphasize. Yeah, does it work? I think, yeah. Uh, yeah, in general, general I agree with um, this analysis. Um, I think one important aspect is that we cannot think about a world without work. He, he doesn't put it that way, but I think that's what we always have to keep in mind, that it's, I think there's always going to be work, but um, he criticizes the work-centeredness of society. I think that's an important uh, aspect, how we're going to think about this post-work discourse. And, yeah, I think it's totally true that many of these positive effects that we're always saying work has are not fulfilled anymore in recent times. But I would also argue that it was more or less during the whole history of capitalism. I think you will know better than me, but if you think about history of capitalism, you had capitalism was introduced by force. People were forced to, to work in factories. The land were taken away. And, um, so I think, in general, this crisis of work has always been existing. If you go a little bit further, you had this golden era, era of maybe, of, let's say, the socio-democratic period after Second World War. And even then, you had, you had female, the female labor force that was excluded from, from the working sphere. And you had this, actually, this inclusion through the working process only worked because of huge state interventions. So I think there was always some inherent crisis to work. Um, another important question I would say is, oh, another aspect we have to focus on is working time reduction. Why did it stop in the 80s? And if you think about working time reduction, which would probably lead to a post-work society in the long run if we just continue this trajectory of working time reduction from, the nine, from 1900 to 1980 and continue lower to lower weekly working hours, sooner or later probably we would have this qualitative shift to a post-work society. But working time reduction stopped in the 1980s and yeah, that's why. We have to ask why did it stop and who is responsible for, for stopping this process. Um, so I think there are already concepts that are not so new um, about this post-work effect. And if I may quote a guy who recently turned 200, I guess you know who I'm talking about, he said, for as soon as the distribution of labor comes into being, each man has a particular exclusive sphere of activity which is forced upon him and from which he cannot escape. He is a hunter, a fisherman, a herdsman, or a critical critic, and must remain so if he does not want to lose his means of a livelihood. Pretty much sounds like the current state of affairs, I would say. While in a communist society, where nobody has one exclusive sphere of activity, but each can become accomplished and any branch he wishes, society regulates the general production and those makes it possible for me to do one thing today and another tomorrow. To hunt in the morning, fish in the afternoon, rear cattle in the evening, criticize after dinner, just as I have in mind, without ever becoming a hunter, fisherman, herdsman, or critique. So I would say this pretty much sounds like post-work. <laughs> so, and I would like to finish with this statement of Karl Marx, because I think it shows us that there are, oh, these ideas are already quite old. <laughs> Thank you. Um, going back to the to the uh, title of this panel discussion, um, Andrea, uh, from a historical perspective, um, do you think we are heading towards a future without work? 
Yeah, thank you for having me as a historian uh, who doesn't look into the future, but who also looks into the past, which is my <laughs> function today. But of course, we will hopefully be able to combine it. Uh, I mean, the question if a workless future is, is likely, it depends on how we define work. Uh, and uh, we got used to this uh, definition uh, that uh, work is gainful employment uh, uh, that is regulated by labor laws that is, it, that is entitling uh, to uh, social security. Uh, and if we look in the historical sense, when such a situation took place in reality, it, uh, it occurred uh, in the 1880s. I think it was before the Second World War. So it was when the first uh, uh, law, labor regulation came up uh, uh, and social security was introduced in the industrialized world and it lasted until 1980. So it was just a, a short period when this definition of work was the typical one. Uh, it, that is what's quite new in history because before work was considered much broader. Uh, uh, if you look at the family household, which was the, let's say, usual uh, unit of, of, of living uh, and, and working, uh, uh, people, uh, all family members, they worked for the market, so they did commodified work and they also worked for subsistence, uh, so they did unpaid work and uh, there was no division between the work that was for the market or the work that for, was for subsistence. Uh, uh, so, 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 so it was a very broad uh, understanding of work and it was only with the separation of working and living, uh, it's of course a longer process, uh, uh, but uh, with the factory system, with the industrial revolution, uh, that a new understanding of work came up. Uh, an understanding that work was labeled everything which was done outside the house, and that work that was performed inside the house, that lost uh, the character of work. It was, also, uh, uh, it, it was not considered to create value anymore. Value was the, 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 the work that was done uh, in the paid, uh, gainful sphere, and the work uh, uh, in, in the household was devalued. Yeah? Uh, it was not considered work anymore. I think that is quite important uh, because there's a category that we should also include in our uh, debate, the ca not, not only the category of no work, but also the category of non-work. Uh, uh, because by defining work uh, uh, within this gainful uh, uh, definition, yeah, uh, with more or less access to uh, social security, all these uh, activities that didn't correspond to that definition, they were... Uh, uh, how, to, how to say they, they were excluded from 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 from, from being work. Uh? Now, if we look at the uh, uh, real situation of people in in, in, in the colonies or the, the global south, uh, or also in, in European peripheries, uh, work of course was much more diverse diverse than this uh, 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 narrow definition of gainful uh, regulated employment. Uh? Uh, so people were living in much less security and, uh, and, and, and in, a, in, a, in a bigger combination of different uh, work and labor relations where they had to combine paid labor with unpaid labor, especially because if they didn't earn enough in the, in the, in the paid economy, in the gainful economy, it was necessary to compensate for, that, for those low, low, low pay by doing uh, unpaid or, or informal labor. And I think it's quite interesting to see that this situation that was quite usual for for the for the globe, yeah? uh, we just forgot about it in our industrial uh, in our industrialized world. Uh, this situation is re returning to the global north since the 1980s, more or less. Yeah? And it's also quite interesting to see that uh, in in many of the newly industrializing countries uh, of the of the global south, factory work in global commodity chains, uh, on the contrary, is increasing. So I would say it's it's quite right that we've we face this reduction of gainful employment, uh, and uh, this is not typically anymore, yeah? uh, so it is in the decline, but I do not see the decline of work, yeah? because my notion of work is broader, so I see that precarious and informal jobs are rising, I see that activities that are necessary to survive in a, in a modern society, uh, 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 manifold such activities are increasing. Uh, first, of course, also subsistence work, yeah? uh, uh, care work, community work, that you 
people have to do in order to, 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 to live with the low wages in rural and in, in urban uh, areas. But also housework, I would say, is still quite important. It is changing its, uh, its face, of course. Uh, it is much more, not, not just for, let's say, baking cakes or so, but for self-styling, for communication, for career building, for bodybuilding. So, so, so there's a lot of, 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 of work performed. And then there's, there's also the question, how to assess all the work uh, that state officials, bank employees, shopkeepers, uh, cashiers, and so on, uh, who lost their jobs and uh, that we replace by our own uh, so-called private work, uh, uh, that we are performing all the time with our little devices. Uh, uh, this is also a, 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 something that I would call work. This is a way for companies to save costs uh, for wages and make us take over the work. Uh, so I. Uh, actually, I see that work is expanding and multiplying, yeah? and it is shifting from a, no, no, a, a narrow notion of, of work, as, uh, defined as this gainful employment, to a variety of activities that, again, combine paid and unpaid work. Uh, of course, this is characterized by social fragmentations, by big uncertainties, and that's why, uh, although I, my approach is somehow different from that uh, no-work approach, uh, I also see the necessity for this uh, different organization of work and to a diff uh, different understanding and uh, definition of work. Thank you. Um, Fridolin, maybe you can... Thanks. Um, you are dealing uh, at the Chamber of Labour with the ongoing um, automatization and digitization of work. Um, do you think work is going to disappear because robots are going to take our jobs. Also, given the fact that we had huge technological progress also in the past and that this actually didn't change a lot about the, yeah, that we still have jobs. Thank you very much. Thank you also very much for having me here today. Um, uh, well, it's an inter interesting question and naturally, um, uh, well, I don't really believe that we'll run out of work. As I think as long as there are humans, um, um, there's going to be work. So um, there's not, it's not a question about the end of work, it's maybe a question of the end of income, and this is basically um, what we've been discussing, how we define work and what is work and what is not work. Um, so it's a question of, of redistribution and how we manage that and how we uh, manage um, social inc inclusion and all, and all that. And we've learned um, before that work nowadays does help us to be socially included, to, to demand for, for rights, for, to, for, to demand for um, uh, making a living, to earning a living wage. And this is something that, that is possibly under threat, yes. Um, as, we've, um, as we're witnessing, robots are taking traditionally jobs in, in industrial or in the industry. And these are traditionally jobs that are rather well-paying jobs because there's a rather direct connection between the job and uh, productivity gains. And so it's easier for unions and, and so on and so forth to, to um, bargain for, for rising wages. And these jobs are increasingly being automated. But we also witness new jobs that are um, um, growing and, and, and rising. And these are traditionally jobs that are either not paid at all or paid um, at a lesser rate. So I think the question is one of how we are valuing um, the work that is being done and how we are managing to, um, to bridge the gap between where the profits and the productivity gains are made and where the jobs and the work is being, being done. Um, because maybe we don't want to see, um, uh, I don't know, big productivity gains in, in care work, for example, because it's not the, the focus of the work here. So, no, I don't think we're going to face a jobless or workless future. Um, uh, but um, uh, we are going to see a future in which we have to fight again. It's a fight of interests. Who is going to, to um, benefit of the developments? Is it the ones who own the robots, the ones who invest into the robots? Or is it everyone else? Um, uh, and it's, yeah, it's, it's a question of basically of participation um, that, that we're facing and that we are going to need to find answers. And hopefully we're going to find answers in a, in a broad and democratic um, approach that involves a lot of people um, rather than just a few. Because it's also a question now that we're witnessing all these technological developments. 
um, who develops um, what. Mm -hmm. Because the technology as such doesn't dictate how it's going to be implemented, right? Technology doesn't tell us I need to be implemented in a way that I take away a job of a person or something like that. It could very well be implemented in a way that it um, complements uh, human, um, uh, I don't know, abilities or um, helps and makes the, the work more fruitful and frees up, I don't know, space for creativity and such, such things. But this, again, is a question of does the person who is working has a say in how the robot is going to be implemented or not? Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so, Lawrence, um, thanks. Um, in your research, you focus a lot on utopias, also utopias of work. Um, so, what can we imagine as a utopia of work? Is it like, um, is it, do you mean by that that we don't have to work anymore? Or, or what, what kind of utopias of work are there? Um, well, first of all, uh, I just wanted to, to start by saying, by, by thanking you and, and the other organizers for inviting me to, to Vienna and for your hospitality and the warm welcome. Um, in response to the question, I'm, I, before I respond to that or, or by way of responding to it, I also wanted to touch on some of the points that, that some of the other speakers have made, which I, which I thought were very interesting and also relevant to that question. Because, um, so I, I do quite a bit of research on at the utopian tradition, but the utopian tradition isn't just about looking forward, it's also about looking backwards. Um, and, uh, and I try to be very historically informed in my research. So um, I suppose my answer to the question would be um, partly in response to the other points that were made. I mean, one of the points which was made was um, that um, the crisis of work has always existed. And, and then I think and Andrea's presentation was very helpful because what, what you did is you historicized the concept of, of work. And I think the important point that you made was that the uh, concept of the wage-based society of linking um, work to, uh, of linking income, of linking work to paid employment is a relatively recent one, historically. And I think that's a very, very important point to make because you know, we tend to um, uh, think in the moment about you know, what the dominant social form of work is at the moment. And I think if we're going to think about alternatives to a, um, uh, the wage-based society, it's important to think about it in broad historical context. I mean, the other point that was made, and this is where I'm going to respond to your question directly, is the point that was made, uh, which I think a very good one, is that you, you made, um, you said, there will always be work, right? So, I mean, um, and that's something when I was listening to, 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 to David's presentation, David Frayn's presentation, I was thinking about, um, I think that that phrase, um, a post-work society, is an interesting one, but it's also potentially misleading. It may lead some people to believe, the idea of a post-work society, that we're imagining a society where people did no work, where they sat around, they, they slept, they enjoyed the sunshine, but they didn't work, right? And, and of course, that is, that is one part of the utopian tradition. There's a long tradition of imagining alternatives to the wage-based society, or imagining alternatives to uh, in peasant utopias, for example, imagining alternatives to a life of drudgery, um, where people imagine a life not centered on laborious work. So in the land of Cocania tradition, it's called, for example, uh, this is from a uh, peasant's utopia, where, uh, where people imagine sleeping all day, resting, uh, they imagine... Uh, um, uh, cooked poultry flying into uh, people's mouths, right? I mean, this, these sorts of visions, which one could imagine, a peasant's utopia. And there is a long tradition. I think two, two, there's two strands, in a direct answer to the question, two strands of the utopian tradition which are relevant to, to this discussion and to your question more specifically. One strand of the utopian tradition are utopias in which 
uh, the authors, if we're talking literary utopias, imagine a significant reduction in working time um, in which we're freed up particularly by automation, by machines, um, to enjoy our leisure time. So the machines will do the work for us. And uh, I mean, it, this is in, um, uh, there's an interesting uh, uh, work which was written by Marx's uh, son-in-law, uh, Lafargue, The Right to be Lazy, right? So this is one, this is one strand of the utopian tradition. And I, what I would call that is the liberation from work tradition. But there's also another very important strand of the utopian tradition, which people are maybe a little bit less aware of, and that's what I would call the liberation of work tradition. So in that tradition of utopian writing, there's an imagination that in, an, in a post-work, in a post-wage-based society, that there would be a significant reduction in working time, a significant reduction in the working week. But along with that, there would be a qualitative transformations of work such that the distinctions between work and play were broken down, which we tend to think of as dichotomous terms, work versus play. Or the distinctions between work and leisure are broken down. Or the distinction between work and art and I think that's a very important strand of the utopian tradition because it tries to imagine a society where people without the threat which exists in capitalist societies, so that in capitalist societies, why do people work? Well, you have the, the stick of the fear of starvation, right? If you don't work, you don't get an income, you can't make ends meet. And you have the carrot of the greed of gain, right? Those are the main motivations to work. And in these qualitative, these utopias of work, people imagine very different motivations for work. Right? It, uh, motivations that involve community, that involve social recognition, uh, that involve playful competi competition, um, desire for variety of work, um, work as a form of art, um, and, and, um, and I think these utopias can help us think about uh, what, what David and what some of us are calling a, a post-work society. Thank you. Um, it was mentioned several times that income, uh, that work is a, is a relevant source of, of income, actually the main mechanism to distribute income, but also to gain social status. Um, are there, how could it be different do we see in history other forms how to gain social recognition and, and income? Because we, do, we don't know any, any other form, or how could we organize it differently? And who is that term? Andrea, maybe? I mean, it depends uh, in which <laughs> layer of history we, we go back. Of course, we can uh, look at uh, historical periods that were not commercialized. Uh, then, of course, uh, uh, Work is something completely different, and 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 these uh, uh, traditional societies they often lack a general notion of work, but they, uh, uh, all the activities that are done to, for survival, but also for 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 asking for the blessing <laughs> of the harvest or or for for cultural activities and so on. Uh, uh, I mean, the, the, it, it was not. It was not defined if they were work or just other activities, uh, but they were necessary and flowing into into one process of life. But uh, uh, as soon as uh, market economies came up, and that of course was long before capitalism came up, uh, uh, work was a mechanism in order to gain income. Uh, uh, and and these household economies of which I spoke uh, were paid and unpaid activities. Uh, uh, flow into one household income, uh, uh, nevertheless they, they were commercialized because otherwise they couldn't have survived. Uh, but uh, uh, they were not merely commercialized, they, they, they were accepting other activities outside of, of, of gainful employment or, or work for the market uh, as part of the, of the household economy and, and, and they were, they, 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 
they contributed to, to, to the prestige of these people. Yeah? Of course, uh, these, these are uh, uh, class societies or, or, or hierarchical, hierarchical societies, so, so, the, so I, do, I do not speak of equality in, the, in these households. Uh, but nevertheless, for instance, age or, or, uh, was something that was not devaluated, but which was valuated, and also children could do valuable work and so on. Yeah? So, so it was not just a, along the category of, of remuneration that, that valuation came up. So, so this reduction uh, of value to what is uh, profitable at the market, that is something of course that came in with, with capitalism uh, into those societies that were market societies already before. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Lawrence, I have another question for you. <laughs> because I always... yeah. Um, it's a bit difficult with only two microphones, but I think, yeah. Um, so, um, is there, do, do you think, because we have this, uh, also David mentioned it in his talk, that um, actually all parties from right to left, their main policy goal is to create more employment. Do you think there's a lack of progressive and radical ideas mm. in the public discourse? Yeah. Hmm. That's an interesting question. Um, I think so if you, it depends what part of the, the, the public discourse you mean. Mm -hmm. So um, if one looks at the mainstream political discourse, mainstream political parties, the mainstream media, um, then yes, um, I'd say clearly. I mean, this is the mantra which is repeated over and over again. We need more jobs. We need more economic growth. Um, you know, the idea of a politician running on a platform of no growth um, or a post-work society, it's, I mean, it would be a very difficult case to make. Although, having said that, um, in David Frayn's presentation, it, it occurred to me when I was watching the presentation there, he mentions the example of the United States, and he says, well, both Bernie Sanders and, and Trump were running on a platform of more jobs and more growth. Interestingly, though, and, and you can find this online, um, Bernie Sanders recently traveled to West Virginia, uh, to Appalachia, one of the poorest parts of the United States, and he had a meeting, a town hall meeting, with uh, coal miners. And these were coal miners who had voted for Trump because Trump said to them, um, you know, if you vote Democratic, you're going to lose your jobs because they're concerned about the environment and they don't care about the coal industry, right? Um, in any case, Sanders went down, he spoke with those coal miners and, um, and he said, look, I'm gonna be honest with you, these, these jobs in the coal industry are, will disappear. They're, they're you know, it's a, a dying industry. But we, what we will do is we'll focus on other things that are very important to you and they'll be um, you know, he addressed their health concerns, he addressed educational issues, et cetera, et cetera. And by the end of this conversation, people who um, were, you know, didn't want to, to listen to what he was saying were, were listening and were engaging in, in dialogue. The other part of your question, though, is, or the other, I think, part of my response to your question is looking to the margins. Right, so in the mainstream discourse, there's not particularly radical ideas about work. But if one looks to a long historical tradition, and not just the utopian tradition, of radical writings about work, one can find um, uh, quite different ideas. Um, one can find, for example, and this would be true of the literature on work and technology as well, um, uh, people who have um, you know, from William Morris and Kropotkin in the 19th century to G.D.H. Cole in the 20th century to the Spanish anarchists to uh, uh, Lewis Mumford uh, to Murray Bookchin in social ecology. Many people have tried to imagine alternatives to the work-based society and have pointed to various historical examples of societies where this has been successfully uh, done. So for example, just to take one example, to, to be brief, one example, the example of, um, of Spain in 1936 during the Spanish Revolution. Uh, 
And um, the, the young George Orwell, who was a journalist at the time, traveled to Barcelona in 1936, um, and he was quite startled by what he found, the social revolution, which he found ongoing there. Um, it was a, um, a society, he said, in which um, ceremonial forms of address had largely disappeared. People looked one, one another in the eye and treated one as equals, regardless of the work they were doing, um, in which various communities had abolished money, done away with money, had um, instituted the old communist, uh, if not uh, state socialist, um, uh, uh, principle from each according to his or her ability to each according to his or her need, um, in which there was a form of direct democracy practiced rather than representative democracy, where people discussed and debated the key issues that affected their communities from the organization of work to trade with other communities. Um, and actually, interestingly, um, these for at least a short period of time, uh, for the three years that this social revolution took place, it was actually quite successful even in conventional economic turn, uh, uh, terms. But of course, these experiments uh, throughout history face trenchant opposition from the powers that be. In the case of Spain in 1936, you had the intervention of Hitler's Germany, Mussolini's Italy, um, uh, 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 Stalin in the Soviet Union. And, I mean, you have the same thing going on right now in, um, in Rojava, a tremendous social experiment which is uh, in danger in part due to uh, Turkish military intervention. Mm -hmm. um, thanks. Um, you already um, mentioned also ecological issues uh, in your example about the coal miners because um, often... Um, jobs or the employment question um, and environmental issues are seen as a trade-off um, and I want to um, well focus on ecological aspects now because um, if we uh, take the Paris Agreement seriously we actually have to reduce carbon emissions um, to zero in less than um, two decades um, and we also know that actually past increases in labor productivity were only possible because we um, employed a, a, a huge, huge amounts of fossil fuels and materials. Um, and when we now talk about digitization um, of work and robotization, um, also those technologies are fundamentally based on fossil fuels and uh, materials which are limited. Um, so given that those resources are limited um, and we have to decrease them drastically in the near future, um, what, what does it mean regarding the future of work? Um, maybe Fridolin, you can um, say something about that uh, because you deal with the question of how digitization um, can also be realized in a socially just way and isn't it that we actually have to um, discuss whether we actually can use those technologies at all given the ecological um, crisis we are facing? Okay, I'll, I'll try, but just one um, short remark to what you just said earlier with the coal miners. I found that very interesting um, because I think it's a very illustrative, illustrative example of the changes that we're witnessing, right? There's jobs that are um, vanishing that, and then there's jobs um, that are said to be vanishing, but actually it's only tasks of the jobs that are um, changing. And so we're basically witnessing a big transformation and we need to manage that transformation. Um, in, in jobs that are being created. In, if you're staying in the energy industry, the solar energy, for example, solar, well, there's lots of jobs being created. In the coal, there's not. Obviously, the people cannot just um, transfer. So this is a, a huge um, task for us as a society um, to manage that and how to find solutions um, to, to, to make this transformation a success for, for many people. And then it's, of course, what we're also wit witnessing capitalist system sets the incentives, right? I find this very interesting in why is there so much brain and money going into um, online marketing, for example, or developing a um, vacuum cleaning robot, 
rather than putting all this um, investments and all this um, smart people in thinking of how to solve actual problems. Exam example being um, how to make the world more, I don't know, sustainable, for example, or how to um, reduce our um, resource um, extensive production. And then there's another um, uh, um, approach that I would um, opt for, and that is um, trying to to look at how uh, strategic or how um, certain um, goods are increasingly being um, privatized. Um, the internet is accessible to everyone, but increasingly we're witnessing a few companies that are, um, due to network effects and so on and so forth, um, monopolizing certain aspects of the internet, thinking of social um, um, platforms, um, search engines, and so on and so forth. And what we're also um, looking at very um, curiously is how platforms that intermediate work um, are being developed and that's a so-called phenomenon of crowd work um, which is a very precarious form of work um, but which is um, where there's a lot of jobs um, being distributed so um, it's maybe for us um, a big issue of how um, digitalization is changing how, how work is um, um, conducted and distributed and how in the digitalized world there's always this um, risk and the danger of, of monopolies. And so we have to think of, and also coming back to, to your question um, with the ecological perspective, I think needing to invest um, into um, public infrastructure that is accessible to, to everyone and, and avoiding this um, building of monopolies, which is essential, I think, in, in times like this. Um, and also essential in when we're looking at how do we, how do we manage this inequality issue. And we're witnessing that these companies, Facebook, Google, um, Apple, and what have you, that were very much, um, they relied at the early stages of their founding years very much on public investments. If you look at the iPhone, um, Matsukato wrote that in her book, nothing that makes the iPhone a smart phone um, was um, uh, for the first time developed by Apple, but was actually um, can actually be linked to big public um, investments and big pub publicly funded research projects and so on and so forth. Um, and so they relied on, on public spending to to make a um, successful product. They only sort of um, the entrepreneurs saw what what is there and and saw the opportunity to combine it to a very um, attractive product, but now they have no interest in, uh, in, in basically paying taxes and allowing the next wave of big public um, spending because that could potentially um, uh, build up their, their future competitors, right? So they were reliant on all of that. Now it's, it's in, the, in their very own interest um, to not pay as much tax because then it's not the government and the public and everyone who is investing into the next wave of technological development, but it's actually only them. They're the only ones who have the money to invest. They're the only ones who have the money um, to conduct research projects and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And this again brings us to this um, issue on, uh, on uh, a jobless future versus an incomeless future, right? Because if we, if, if we are witnessing that there's um, work being done in, in, in jobs that are not being paid as well as we would like them to be paid, then we have to somehow um, bridge um, this gap and um, manage um, the, yeah, um, the, the money flow from where it is to where it's needed. But was your argument that the state should invest more into ecological um, sound infrastructure or because yes, I didn't get that? Yes, that's, yeah. that's one, one issue. Uh -huh. um, uh, and also in energy efficient transportation and, and so on and so forth. Uh -huh. But also avoiding the build up of, of strong monopolies um, uh, yeah. by, okay. by either investing in, in, into uh, future competitors or what has been done in historical times um, regulation mm -hmm. basically. Okay. Um, Franz, um, I would also be interested in what you think about the ecological questions and regarding robots because there are also some post-work uh, thinkers like Surnicek and Williams um, who kind of dream of a fully automated future. 
So kind of this, there's also in, in the post-work literature this strand um, or this imagination of uh, a future where robots um, are going to take over our jobs and kind of free us from work. Um, do you think um, that is in line with ecological concerns? Yeah, full automation. It, actually, it's cool. You don't need to hoover your floor anymore. It's who wants to hoover the floor? So actually, yeah, it would be nice to have all these things. Um, and jobs, if we're positive about the jobs that get lost, people will learn something new. People will be able to find new meanings in life. But if we, as you said, if we have this problem of uh, coupling CO2 emissions and and environmental harm to this um, digitalization-based digitalization automation, um, we have to rethink the whole thing. So maybe then automation, automation is not so cool. And then we have to think about how can we reduce the damage we're doing to the environment. And this, I think, will only work if we can build up a new kind of normative pattern in society that, that is the basis for recognition. Maybe I can put it in a but you in metaphor. Um, as long as the person who is having the better car, the newer car, the bigger flat, the cooler uh, travel to a foreign destination, um, is the one who is the winner of the game of, in our society, who is the winner, who you know that this person um, wins the, or has a higher, uh, let me think about it again. This person, according to the rules of the game, this person wins who has this higher status in material terms. And as long as this, um, this relation is true for people, I think we will have a problem in finding another way of, of a more ecological way of living. So I think we need a new narrative, a new way of um, connecting successful living, maybe even status or recognition to a, um, to a less harmful way. Could it also be that we have actually, we have to work more in the future because, because of ecological concerns, robots cannot do our jobs anymore and we have to, we have to take over the jobs robots are doing now? Well, <laughs> that's a, a very, very theoretical question, I would say, but I don't think that this would be the case. Um, but I think if we would really, really need to base our production more on our own work and not on machines' work and not on all this... Um, what is dünger, for example? Fertilizer. Fertilizers, yeah. Um, I think in general we would get a huge problem because we can't really grow the, all the carrots on this dead ground anymore. So. I don't know. <laughs> we have to think what we can do then. Yeah. Also, if we assume we don't have tractors anymore, which yeah. run on fossil fuels, and maybe, well, yeah. Um, so, in the last round, I would like to um, raise some, well, or to, to tackle the feminist perspective as well. Uh, because actually, in the past and also in the present, um, still, there's one feminist, uh, one main feminist strategy has been that um, um, that um, as much uh, women as possible uh, get into full full time and paid employment, um, which which is actually a, a male uh, domain, um, and these strategies have also been criticized. Um, um, Maybe, Andrea, uh, what do you think from a feminist historian perspective? Do you think that is an emancipatory strategy to bring as much female um, workers or to, yeah, w women into paid employment? Yeah, I, I'm very skeptical about that. Uh, but on the other hand, it's not so easy to say women stay at home. Uh, you also work there. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, you comply to my definition of work, so, so stay there and, and let, uh, let the, f the field of commodified work to the men. But uh, let, uh, let me uh, uh, just make a comment, because uh, listening to the discussion and also to David's uh, uh, film at the beginning, uh, I think, to my mind, post-work is, 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 
indeed misleading, as, as you also mentioned, but because, not because people think uh, uh, in, in, this, in this surrounding uh, people would be lazy and, and, and work would not be performed anymore, but because it is uh, using the same narrow definition of work as those who are adv advoc advocates of work. Yeah? Uh, and uh, so, so uh, this, this doesn't ac acknowledge these other forms of work that you do because of necessity, because of uh, their fulfilling and, and, and uh, character, because you, you uh, to my mind, it's, it's, it's also a human uh, 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 need uh, to, 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 to realize uh, himself or herself in, 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 a, in a piece of work, in a piece of art, in, in, in an activity that is fulfilling and satisfying. Yeah? And if we acknowledge that and we see this broad necessity of, uh, and, and also uh, a possibility and options of, of, of work, yeah? then of course we have to dis discuss about the distribution of work. Yeah? And then of course it's quite clear that this uh, f uh, gainful work that uh, is a key to income uh, I think it's not so easy to overcome it. Uh, I mean, of course, we could discuss this very theoretically too, but I accept this as a as a as a reality. Yeah? Uh, but uh, it it could be reduced, of course, and uh, 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 c compensated or, or, or uh, how to say uh, combined uh, with the acknowledgement of other works. I mean, to a certain extent, this is the case because voluntary work, uh, care, uh, housework, and so unpaid housework, they have a certain acknowledgement. But, uh, but they, they, uh, they, if, if you combine them with, uh, with, pay, with, uh, with paid work, uh, uh, then you have your income with the help of paid work, uh, but at a low level. And of course, in certain periods of life, you have to be freed from paid work. Yeah? Uh, children, old people, and also uh, maternity and other leaves. Yeah? And, and then uh, you have the time to do these other kind of works. Uh, but of course, society would have to find a mechanism that, uh, that all people participate in this work. That's, I, I would say, a, a, quite a complicated problem to solve. Uh, because even if we... Uh, paint these other works as very fulfilling and uh, and so on. Uh, uh, and for instance, we say, okay, housework, for for instance, is something that is uh, that is nice. Uh, it, it's not something that you should get rid of. You can uh, uh, realize yourself in in housework. Yeah? Uh, but then, of course, uh, you you have to make sure that uh, that you are not cut off of income. Yeah? So so that uh, a certain commodification of housework can help, but also, of course, an acknowledgement of of housework as something that is uh, 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 complementing uh, uh, gainful employment. So that's more or less my perspective for 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 our societies. But I think uh, one efficiency of our discussion and also what I said now is the fact that we have a complete Global North uh, perspective. Yeah? So we, uh, we, we forget uh, about the fact that, of course, newly industrializing countries, uh, there's a lot of people who, uh, who, where you cannot so easily say less is more yeah? because they have so few uh, that they need some more. So, so this income distribution between north and south is, of course, also something uh, that uh, that would uh, 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 be necessary. And if you have that in mind, then all these ideas of how you could uh, reduce the working hours in the global north uh, 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 are not as easy anymore, because, of course, all these ideas rely rely on the fact that you get these cheap products uh, where p other people have to work long hours for that, uh, and also want uh, want want a better. A, be a better living. Yeah? Uh, so I'm, I mean, at the end, I'm quite pessimistic uh, uh, how we can overcome this this growth uh, uh, imperative, uh, because these uh, newly industrializing countries, I think, uh, we have to acknowledge also their right uh, to to participate in the in the global uh, product, uh, 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 and uh, I think the only way how we could be serious in 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 convincing them to to uh, to obey to let's say eco ecological aims would be to reduce uh, the, uh, the 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 spending of 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 uh, 
of resources in our society, and that of course would, would mean a complete uh, uh, restructuring of our economy uh, and a complete uh, restructuring of global commodity chains that live on that on these disparities. Uh, uh, so, so it's interesting to see how the discussion about work goes into many other fields that would have to be changed uh, in order to find a, a way of work that uh, that could correspond to this to this more just and and. and uh, 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 fulfilling uh, notion that we all have in mind. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, maybe is there the need for short comments on that before we open the floor to the... Yeah? Well, maybe uh, maybe yeah. just a quick, quick comment on that. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Quick, a quick comment on that. Um, Yeah, so two, two quick points about the, um, I mean, the first point that, that I wanted to comment on was the, the definitions of work and the extent to which even post-work theorists employ a very narrow definition of work which mirrors the definition of work which is adopted by the supporters of the existing regime of work. Um, and I think, I think that's true. To, to some extent, it's interesting in, the, in aspects of the utopian tradition, for example, Ursula Le Guin's feminist and, and ecological anarchist utopian novel, The Dispossessed, which was published in 1974, one of the worlds which is depicted in this ambiguous utopia, the world of Anares, um, has invented a new language called Pravik, um, which employs the same word for work and play. So it's the same exact word in, in Pravik, work as play, but they have a different word for drudgery, for drudgery, for, for work which is inherently unpleasant, irksome, necessarily irksome work. So I think, I, I think that's a helpful point to make, that it's, we need to be more careful about definitions. Yeah? We also have Arbeit and Werk. Mm. Yeah? And in but not in, in English, it's, in, in English it's, it's a slightly different tradition. But, but the, the, the other point, just if I could make just briefly, was, um, well, maybe it's not a need to make it, but the point about the, the, the global north and the global south, I mean, to some extent, my concern would be that the, the point you're ma making is itself a global north perspective, in the sense that there are many movements in the global south which um, uh, uh, are movements for radical reduction in technology, for radical transformations of the nature of work, from the Mukti Sangarsh in India to uh, the MST in Brazil. So I think it's important not to homogenize the, the, the global south or to imagine that we have to lead the change because I think that at, we in the global north, because I think that some of the most interesting innovations with regard to uh, post-work and degrowth are actually emerging out of the global south. Thank you. Um, you will have the possibility for a final statement, but um, I would like to open the, the floor for uh, your questions. <laughs> so please raise your hands. Uh, or mine. Um, thank you for, for this um, very interesting discussion. My name is um, Martina Schöckel. I'm the chair of a feminist career network in Vienna. Um, um, the, a feminist career network in Vienna, so I would like to um, talk a little bit about the feminist question at the end. Um, first of all, I would have loved to hear some male opinions on these questions as well, and not only from the female panelists. Um, and um, my, my, I just want to add something because um, you asked if um, it's the right strategy to um, um, try to bring more female, more, more women to work 40 hours per week. And I think in the second wave of feminism, when feminists were trying to get women into the workforce, it was very important to 
um, to use this strategy and to ask for more women in the workforce. And because so many things are only accessible if you work, if you participate in the working world, um, like um, pension system and um, yeah, you name it. And until the 1970s, for many women, it wasn't possible to go to work, to work without the allowance of their husbands or their fathers. But now, of course, every generation has to fight its own fights. Um, and maybe today we, today we have to ask um, how um, we can get men to participate in more unpaid work and how we can um, um, make sure that we all um, take part in care work. And, and so maybe... Um, having a shorter working week and working less hours per week would be a good strategy for that. Yeah. And that would maybe something we can achieve today or look for. Yeah. So maybe we the next question? Okay, so who has some? I have the question, how, can you, how is it possible to redistribute the work if you have the need for a lot of high educated specialists and today you have not enough of the specialists and when you redistribute the work, you need even more people. So how can you even redistrib thinking about or talking about redistributing of the work if you have not uh, enough specialists to redistribute the work too? Um, yeah. First, I want to thank you all for the discussion, and I would say I very much agree with, with Franz what you said about that it's, we need a new normative for how to redistribute wealth and status in our societies. So my question is, since we stated, like all of you stated, it's like both on the political left and on the political right, there's like no such movement at all, like it's, like it's only like more jobs, like everyone should be employed. So what's your, what do you think, how, how is it possible to implement that in our politics? Like, does it have to be bottom up or can it be like um, top down or um, what's your opponent, opinions about that? Hi, I think an important connection or topic that maybe wasn't addressed enough is the link between work and inequality. Because when we think about wanting to change work and transform work, we also think of we, we want to do that maybe because we also want to reduce inequality and reduce poverty in today's world. So one way to do this would be to make sure there's more work for more people because there's so much unemployment now. So as we said, reduction of the working hours, redistribution of work. Then another idea is to change the way we value work because there's so many very lowly paid jobs nowadays that could be paid better than the jobs that are actually the hardest and no one wants to do. But then what about another, the idea that's radical of democratizing the means of production and changing work from alienated labor to people, I don't know, changing companies into cooperatives and all of that, the whole of that Marxist idea. Is, does that have any place in these ideas of post-work and the future of work? I feel addressed by the feminism question um, because I did uh, some work, not so much, but I thought about it a bit, let's say, put it this way. Um, yeah, I think shorter working weeks for men and women are the starting point. They can, I think Nancy Fraser put it this way, that man has to, be, has to become more like woman in order to achieve this gender equality because the only, it's the only way it could work because adding the unpaid work to the 40-hour work week of the man employee doesn't work. So, so it's the basis to have this working time reduction in order to achieve this, this equality. But furthermore, it also needs work on the cultural level, I would say. And yeah. Maybe I'll, I'll add on this. Um, I totally agree. I think a reduction of, of um, uh, the working week would be the first um, and also quite specific measurement that one could take and would allow more women to work full time and would allow men to work more um, in the care work and so-called non-paid non work. 
and it's quite specific and I think quite, um, uh, quite a feminist um, approach. Also, I think what is quite um, interesting to observe now in this very technological-driven world is on who, who designs the work. Very often we have in Silicon Valley uh, a very male and very nerdy male-dominated um, uh, um, employment workforce, right? And they're thinking of how, a how an app should work and how, how I don't know, um, how um, future um, platforms where work is intermediated, how all of that works. And traditionally, this, how they're designing a future workplace is traditionally very attractive to other nerdy male um, um, employees, but not so much for, for, for example, for women. So if, if also on an industrial um, level, if more women are involved in designing how um, technology should be applied to the, to the um, working line, uh, if they're more involved in designing it, it might also become more attractive to them um, to work there. Um, so this is also, I think, a, a very interesting uh, question on who designs and who has a say on how technology is applied and how a, a workplace should look like. And then also we have the question on how we evaluate work and naturally maybe it would make sense to to change that. Um, why is it that um, only male-dominated jobs are generally what the ones that are um, paid highest? And now we're saying, okay, well, you women, you should just move to 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 this um, um, to those jobs rather than making the jobs that women are doing um, more va more valuable and 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 better um, recognized and better paid as well, obviously. Um, yeah, and then the, the question of work and inequality, I find that also very interesting. Um, uh, and, and you mentioned um, uh, most of them. Uh, the one that you mentioned that was very interesting is the means of production. And I think we need more corporativism, right? So we have these platforms, and those platforms have the tendency to be monopolized and have a very strong... Um, so we have this sharing economy, and there's not much about... There's not much sharing in the sharing economy. It's very often it's... it's um, uh, very um, a capitalist um, uh, um, ownership behind those platforms, and it's just um, uh, the ones participating on it that are um, uh, working in precarious uh, conditions, and they're not sharing either. Um, uh, so when we're looking at this, I think there is also an approach on how, c and there are um, s um, beginning, some movements are beginning in the United States, um, and also some in, in Europe, and where the platform is owned by the ones that are looking for jobs on those platforms. For example, it is for graphic designers, designers it's very common to, to, to do a job and then being paid only six months later. And if you're not having a very high and very regular salary, uh, you can't bridge those six months. So now they have created a platform that pays them within one month, that also employs them. So basically they're employing themselves on the platform that they, have, they, they commonly own and commonly create um, and also have, and also transfer some of the risks to this platform. So maybe this is the one, one approach, right? To have more um, common access to common goods. Um, yeah. Um, I, I have a certain problem with the discussion. I, on the one hand, I, I'm glad to be in, a, in to see that, that that many people want to change society and uh, reinvent a, a, a system of production, work, and and life uh, that is uh, uh, not dominated by by cap capital accumulation. Yeah? Uh, so I can join this wishful thinking, and I can also join uh, these steps that we conceive towards that more equal society. And I think uh, uh, one of the main battlegrounds indeed is uh, this uh, distribution of uh, of unpaid work uh, uh, between all members of the household. Huh? Uh, uh, I mean, I also see do, uh, men doing uh, unpaid work, but of course it's, a, it's an, un, an equal distribution. So one could uh, uh, redistribute uh, gainful uh, employment and these other uh, un, unpaid works in a society that, that this uh, more justice is, is, is realized. But if I, if I look at this discussion, how we concentrate on that, huh? I, I'm, I'm quite astonished uh, by the way, that, that in a business university, uh, nobody yet uh, raised the question. I mean, we, 
we, we are witnessing the other way around. Yeah? Uh, I mean, there's, uh, there's no, no progress at all in that direction. Uh, of course, certain circles like here discuss it, uh, but, uh, but global competition works in the other way around. Yeah? I mean, uh, uh, all these, uh, these uh, uh, benefits that, uh, that were given to workers uh, reducing working hours and, and, and also uh, more legal protection and, and so on and, and, and more possibilities for, for other activities around the work, uh, the, the, around the work day. I mean, this, the tendency to enlarge these spaces uh, uh, is reversed uh, because if we realize that society where we work, let's say, for 20 uh, hours gainfully and the rest uh, we subdivide among our uh, care and, 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 and uh, voluntary other activities, uh, how should we, I mean, the question, of course, who we are, yeah? but, uh, but to, to a certain extent also as, uh, as, uh, as let's say, workers, uh, we are included into the, uh, uh, the, the competitivity, uh, into the global competitivity, and we, uh, our lifestyle, of course, is depending very much on the, on the, on the, uh, on the profits that, that the Western capital, and it's still a Western capital, is, is, is realizing. Uh, but, of course, it is challenged because there are now, in a more multipolar world, uh, 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 competitors who undermine these ideas of, uh, of uh, reducing work. Uh, I mean, uh, and, and, and the fact that, uh, let's say, I mean, of course, we can look at some of the, of the uh, 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 oppositional uh, 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 movements in, 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 in the Global South. I completely agree that the Global South is not just uh, uh, keen on catching up, because, but others are keen on defending their uh, local communities and, and so on. So I think we can learn a lot of, of, of them. But the, the majority uh, tendency, of course, of the Global South is that they they catch up successfully and they set new standards and the new standards are even much more uh, 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 concentrated on long working hours, reducing all the leisure time and so on, being just ready to do everything that the company uh, uh, needs. Yeah? Uh, and I think it's a, it, it, it's a big confusion that, that the fact that this outsource, outsourcing in these newly industrializing countries enabled some of them, it's not all of them, but China, India and so on, in order to become so competitive that their standards become the ruling standards. Uh, and and, and the, the, the old, let's say, uh, socialist or, or social uh, welfare standards in, 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 the, in the West are undermined by this pressure and, uh, and the Western companies are quite glad that they have a good reason uh, that they also have to uh, make longer working hours. Of course, it's now not longer working hours under a uh, uh, regulated system, but it's longer working hours by, let's say, combined three precarious jobs. Uh, and then if that is realized, then we are competitive. And after these three uh, precarious jobs, yeah, uh, they are open for women and for men. Yeah? Uh, then I, I, I don't know exactly how this, uh, this uh, vision of, of, uh, uh, of wishful thinking that, that we w would like to have in a, in a post uh, 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 value society could come true, and I think we shouldn't we shouldn't ignore that uh, because otherwise we start uh, uh, living on a on a very small part of the planet delinked de from from what is going on in 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 the let's say real world. Yeah, that's what what I was heading to with the rhetoric question: Why did working time reduction end in the 1980s? Um, <laughs> but uh, let me come back to your question about the normative patterns again. Um, I think it's really important to have, we have to now in this, yeah, a little bit the negative view about the realistic view about society, but I think um, we should be positive and maybe uh, find ways of letting utopias grow somewhere. And I think to make this possible, as David Frain said, it, we need to decommodify somehow working um, um, work in general to enable people to think about freely what they can do. And I think this also goes a little bit into the direction of um, radical democratization of production. You need to have this freedom to maybe do things you can do. Um, and yet the Fachkräftemangel, as we say, as we have it in German, the 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 under, hmm? what is a good translation? Scarcity, yeah, scarcity of skilled labor. Yeah, I don't know. Where is really the problem? 
it's <laughs> um, I think it's not so bad to have this scarcity of of skilled labor because it just relatively um, gives labor more power. So I wouldn't say it as a big see it as a big problem. <laughs> So there were four four questions, um, which I'll as, try as best I can to to respond to um, in order. So the the first question was very important question about um, feminism and second wave feminism in particular. And I have to say, in my own work, I'm very much influenced by second wave feminism in particular. Um, so I think that's a tremendously valuable uh, resource. I think specifically in response to your question, my own perspective would be, I mean, as we know that um, uh, paid employment is gender-coded as masculine, uh, care work, domestic work is uh, coded as feminine in a hierarchical value system where that's of far less value and, it's, and that's reflected in pay. And I think it's absolutely essential that, um, the, that we have to challenge that. Um, uh, so um, I think those writings are very helpful in that regard. The one point that I would make is that in some work, in some second wave feminist work, I would put a question mark, uh, you know, in, in the um, uh, sometimes um, uh, uh, the uh, adoption of um, a... a, a um, a work ethic perspective in order to challenge that uh, gender division of labor. So I think it's important not only to, um, uh, to think about uh, redistribution of work on the basis of gender, but also to challenge the notion of waged labor itself. And both can be done, I think, um, uh, successfully. Um, this, the second question, that was asked was about um, uh, specialization. Um, and I think it's important to think about that question in, in a broad historical perspective and not just think about it in a, in a present tense context. So if we think about the transition from the, the, the late medieval period to, uh, to, the, to the early capitalist period, the, the workshop system of, of the early capitalist period, Precisely what defined that tradition was an extreme division of labor, a growth of specialization, a growth of a division between higher status brain work and lower status manual work, work by, by hand. Um, and so I think if we're going to really challenge the, uh, the, uh, at the level of theory and ideology as well as practice the work-based, the wage-based society, that we're going to, to need to challenge that notion of extreme specialization uh, as well. And of course, there are consequences of that, economic consequences, um, but I think that's an essential part of, um, of uh, superseding the wage-based society. The third question, um, uh, yourself, was, um, was about how do we implement this politically, um, and would it be necessarily bottom-up or top-down? And my simple answer to that question, I mean, it's a very long answer because I'm a political scientist, so I have many views on that question, but just very briefly, in the interest of time, to say that I think it would have to be bottom-up. And the reason I say that is because, precisely because of the point that um, Andrea and Franz were making, I mean, we have to be mindful of the very powerful vested interests who want to maintain the wage-based society, um, corporate interests, states, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so they're not going to give up uh, these privileges, prerogatives, without a fight. And it will, I therefore think that, um, at the short answer to your question, is that any sort of change, radical change of the sort which would be necessary to supersede the wage-based society would of necessity uh, be bottom-up. The f final question was um, about the uh, link between work and inequality, and specifically the question of democratization. And um, so 
I think a lot of people now, I mean, so David in his presentation talked about a crisis of work. And I think that's valuable, but we need to think about the broader crises of which that crisis of work is a part. The crisis of global capital, the crisis of global democracy, of representative democracy. Um, and it's when thinking within that context that we can begin to think about the relations between work and democracy. And more specifically, I think we need to have a much broader conception of democracy than the one which is currently prevalent. So most people, if you ask them, what is democracy? They'll say, democracy is a system of electing a government, right? Or it's a form of government, parliamentary government versus presidential forms of democracy. I think we need to think in a much broader historical terms what is democracy? Demos, the origins of the word from ancient Greece. Demos, the, the people. Kratos, power. People power. That's the origins of the word democracy. And if we think about democracy in that very radical sense, which has existed for most of human history, I mean, like the wage-based system, the current system of representative democracy is a tiny portion of human history. If we think about democracy in that much broader uh, sense, um, then we can uh, begin to think about the ways, for, ex for instance, in which our present understandings and practices of work impede popular power. Right? If, if you're spending most of your time working and, and in, in the equivalence of a form of wage slavery, right, it's very difficult to engage politically. Um, it's very difficult to to think about alternatives to the wage-based society, right? So I think what we're, think what we're talking about when we're talking about um, the democratization of work is not simply cooperatives, but cooperatives are very important, but a, um, uh, forms of grassroots uh, popular power um, is essentially what, what, what we're referring to. Thank you. Um, due to time issues, I would suggest that we um, close this official debate now. And But for those of you who are interested, uh, you are invited to join us um, for dinner. We have reserved uh, a table in uh, this campus um, or to just come here afterwards and, and ask your questions. Um, I hope that's fine for you. Um, and then I would um, ask you maybe for a one sentence um, conclusion or statement, maybe what, what your take home message was uh, from, from this panel discussion. I don't have a take home message, but I thought about the question about working hours and a sustainable economy. And I have a good answer regarding this question, I would say. If you think about the development of the after the Industrial Revolution, working hours increased a lot. So before the Industrial Revolution's working hours were less. So I hope we won't drop below this pre-Industrial Revolution level. Depends on a little bit if our soil is so devastated that nothing grows anymore or that we have maybe a little bit more of productivity now. But I think it won't increase a lot. That's my, <laughs> my last word. Thank you. No. Maybe we should move more um, men into housework and care work and then wages wouldn't rise there drastically. <laughs> Maybe that could be an answer to the feminist question. Uh -huh. <laughs> I see a big persistence in maintaining this narrow notion of work, even those who want to overcome it, uh, like you, for instance, just now. Uh, you are falling into that trap all the time for, and not acknowledging the other work that is done outside the employment uh, situation. Uh, so I think we really have to change the way how we speak about work. Uh, 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 and that helps us also to think about new uh, ways of distri distribution. Well, very briefly. Um, so maybe I'll just close with a, with a quotation, which I quoted in the workshop um, from, uh, from Walter Benjamin which is that every rise of fascism bears witness to a failed revolution. Um, and I think that if we think about the rise of authoritarian populisms, of fascisms globally, this is one other direction 
um, that a failure to address these issues can take. So I think the stakes are, stakes are very, very high. Um, thank you. Um, thank you also uh, for staying so long and um, for listening and discussing with us. Um, thanks to the panelists and um, have a nice evening. Thank you.